Heavenly Father, we come in Jesus' name. Lord, I am not capable of breaking down this word to each individual. Only your Holy Spirit can. The one, the light that created the word has to illuminate the word. So let your Holy Spirit enlighten us. I ask you to teach through me and to me. Teach also the people here, Lord. Uh, just have to be said what you would have to be said, and may you be glorified in everything today, in our fellowship and our union together through your Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ. We thank you through the blood of Jesus. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So before I get started, happy birthday to Fred. He's uh, 39, right? 39 years old? 42, okay. And Rosa, this was your get well card we had for you. <laughs> okay. And Javier, I still have your anniversary card up here. So I, I'm going to go ahead and give it to you. <laughs> so God is good, right? We are the body of Christ. We are brothers and sisters with each other. Amen. <clears throat> So when we give cards and, and tell somebody happy anniversary or, or praise God you're well, it's because of the word of God, right? We don't go by what we see. We go by what the word of God says. And the word of God says we go ahead and celebrate because we celebrate the word of God. Amen? My wife, we celebrate her victory because the word of God says she's healed. Uh, this past week, she vacuumed the entire living room by herself. Karen stood up to help her a little bit, but hey, that was called impossible. <laughs> that's right. You know, but that's just, that's just little manifestations of what has already been done. See, it's not that God's doing something. It's already done. You know, the Bible says that Jesus was offered before the foundation of the world what was manifest in these last times for us. Like, it was manifest, it was made known to us, but it's not that it just happened 2,000 years ago. It happened before the foundation of the world. The healing has already taken place. It's just manifesting now. Amen. Javier, your marriage is already... Secure in God's sight, but it's being manifest now. Our health has already been accomplished, but it's being manifest. The salvation of us and our families, we might not see it. It will be manifest, but it's already accomplished. When I see sometimes relatives of mine who died and their children got saved years after their death and their grandchildren got saved, it was already promised. The promise is to you and to your children and all those are far off. The righteousness of God, which is the only righteousness we have, reaches to children and children's children. So we know God is faithful to accomplish it. And we should start praising instead of always, <laughs> instead of always speaking what we see. I had one, one woman call me years ago and she said, my grandson is really upset with me. And I said, well, what's going on? And she said, I told him he is a devil. She said, when he comes in my house, I told him, you are nothing but a devil. And I said, well, that's a big problem. I would have a problem too. Why aren't you speaking what the word of God says and speaking as though it's already done? Speak victory. Speak that you are a child of God and treat him like a child of God. Why can't we act on the word of God instead of on sight and feeling? in marriages, in homes with family, in business places, in healings. Why can't we go ahead and believe what God said without seeing? That's what we need to do, right? I want you to turn your eyes to the screen for a moment. This is a small, this is from the Passion of the Christ. Now, I would love to show part of the video, but I want, especially with children in here. The beating was so bad, I have never been able to watch it. I've watched the movie several times. I cannot bring myself to watch the beating. 
But what it shows is nowhere nearly as bad as it actually was. Mel Gibson, when he made the movie, said, I cannot show it to the full extent because people could not watch it. I remember when this movie came out and across the USA, the opening weekend, seven people had heart attacks watching the movie. I was so upset when I went to the theater, we took our youth group and high school group. We all sat there stunned afterwards, the whole theater sat stunned and all these teenagers were crying. I was so physically upset I could hardly stand up. It was so bad, but this is a little picture, a tiny fraction of the picture of what Jesus went through. Can anybody here tell me this is before Jesus went to the cross. He was beaten, and I heard, a, I heard a person preaching not long ago, and they said, Jesus got those 39 Roman lashes, and I thought he did not get 39 Roman lashes. That's what people got because 40 usually would put them in shock, so they would stop. But Pilate ordered a more severe beating for Jesus so that they would back off. When he came back, he didn't realize they would go that far. They had beaten his back, flipped him over and beat the front, and there was no skin left on him. And you can see ribs. You see the ribs right there? You could see his organs. You could see his ribs. They literally beat him so badly. Isaiah 52 says his visage was so marred more than any man. Now, I was reading an article in the L.A. Times yesterday. The L.A. Times said that the American Medical Association had a group of pathologists and well-known doctors take the case of Jesus. This was pretty recent. And they studied the evidence of his death. Because there are those who say Jesus didn't really die. He was unconscious and the resurrection was really just that he became conscious again. So these doctors, known worldwide, said, the biblical account has to be accurate, and he definitely was dead. S judging by everything, they said, now we can't scientifically prove it, but judging by our knowledge and what the Bible says he went through, he was dead. Furthermore, a six foot, 200 pound man has about seven and a half quarts of blood. So over 10 units of blood. They estimated that Jesus lost one fourth to one third of all his blood at the beating. So that now when they get him up from the beating and march him before Pilate, and he, they put the cross on him, he was beginning to go into shock and couldn't carry his cross. He's physically strong because he's always walking and exercising, but he couldn't carry the cross because he's lost about a fourth or a third of his blood, and he's going into shock, and he's so weak he can't carry the cross. He's trembling. Then they take him to the cross, and the reason this message came up, I was thinking, Jesus died on the cross and was there for six hours. Some people live three days. Some people last three days on the cross. Jesus lasted six hours. But don't forget, I talked about this in our resurrection message. They present the lamb at nine in the morning, the Passover lamb, and they slaughter it at three. So he died at three. He lasted six hours. Now when they put the seven to 10 inch nails in his wrist and feet, they didn't hit any arteries, but they hit major nerves. So now he's getting continuous jolts of high powered shocks going through his body because of the nerves that they pierced. So his legs weren't much use in taking a breath. To get a breath, so this one doctor, Dr. Baden, said, I had my team tie me to a cross just so I could do this article properly and see what it feels like. They didn't put nails, but he said momentarily they hung me on a cross so I could see what the effects of the respiratory system were. 
And he said, you immediately start to suffocate. Because when you're hanging like that, you can't get a breath. So he said, I, I started pulling with my arms. You have to pull up and get a breath and let down. And pull up and let down. Well, Jesus has already lost a lot of blood. And, and they beat his legs so badly and all. He can, he can hardly even pull up. Not to mention, he's not dying like other humans on a cross. He's dying a supernatural death. Does anybody here in here know what the weight of your own guilt and sin feels like? Has anybody been tortured by the weight of your sin and guilt before? Do you, do you know how horrible that is? Multiply that times billions for every human on earth and bear that sin and that guilt. You couldn't even do it. God did. He died on the cross. And I was thinking, why six hours? And I kept thinking, I was praying about this. I, this sat, last Saturday, this message came. And I was thinking, six is the number of man. Right? The final antichrist, the exaltation of man above God will be 666. Right? It's pure human. So when we think of it as devilish, hu humans, our rebellion against God will manifest and the Antichrist, and in the world rejecting God fully, right? So I thought about that. God created the world in six days. On the six days, he had made everything, but that whole creation got cursed. When Adam and Eve sinned, it wasn't just man that got cursed. The entire creation, Paul says, is under the curse, right? In Corinthians, he says that. The whole creation groans and waits to be clothed upon. The whole creation is cursed. Nothing we see is the way God created it. This is a fallen world. This is a cursed world. There was no suffering. There was no disease. There was no sickness. It was perfection. And the whole creation is cursed. So what does Jesus do? For those six days of creation that became cursed, he dies he bears it for six hours. God deals with man for six. You know, one day is what the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. God is dealing with mankind for 6,000 years. Do you know when it started? April 1st, 3975 B.C., Adam was created. Fast forward and go 6,000 years. When is 6,000 years up? April 1st. 2026 will be 6,000 years to the day. The seventh thousand, God rested the seventh day. The millennium, the thousand year period when the devil is chained up, will be the seventh day, the thousand years of rest. So he's dying. Five is the number of grace. I kept thinking, why didn't he die in five hours? It's grace, it's grace for us, but it wasn't grace for him. It was grace for us, but Jesus got no grace. He got no mercy. He got no comfort. Nothing. Nobody stood with him. Psalm 88 is a good explanation. It ends by saying, my closest friend is darkness. The only thing he had was darkness. The first three hours that Jesus was on the cross, it was light. During the first three hours, I'm going to read this. During the first three hours of Christ's crucifixion, there was light. Light is symbolic of God's truth, his holiness, and his purity. The three hours of light were a perfect witness to Christ as the sinless Lamb of God. But the last three hours of the crucifixion, excuse me, were Darkness covered the land. Darkness represents being under God's judgment. So the three hours of darkness were a perfect witness to Christ being judged for the sins of the world. Total darkness. The only one. Now, everybody here, I don't care if in the world, if you're an unbeliever and you're rejecting the Lord, he still is there. God is still, his presence is still there and he's still merciful. But Jesus' own father turned away from him and let him die alone with no mercy, no comfort, no strength, no grace, totally 
separated from God. You know why? Because that's the penalty of sin, separation from God. Had he not died for us, we all would end up separated from God forever. People who reject Jesus Christ and die in that condition will be separated from God by their own choice. Every day, the Holy Spirit works in every heart to say, receive Christ. Even if you're in a country where you've never heard of him, Paul said the invisible things of God, his grace, his mercy, his love, his justice, are clearly seen by the things that are made so that everybody is without excuse. If anybody would just acknowledge there's a God, God will give you specific revelation. You know how many Muslims now, the testimonies are coming in? They're being saved by God coming to them in dreams. They're in areas where they don't know him, but they're being saved because Jesus talks to them through dreams. The Lord will make sure that you know. Nobody has an excuse. Nobody. People will flip that around and say, but God's so good, nobody would go to hell. He's such a loving God, how could he put anybody in hell? He doesn't put anybody in hell. People put themselves in hell. You can either follow Jesus or you can follow Satan because you are following one or the other. If you reject the Lord, people say, but they're good people. They are not good people. There are no good people. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous. No, not one. There's none that does good. There's none that does right. No, not one. There are no good people. And please don't tell people you're a child of God. Oh, we're all children of God. We are not all children of God. He that has the Son has life. Jesus is the seed of the Father, the sperm of the Father. Let's use it that we are eggs, living organisms, and when the seed of the Father comes in, we become a child of God. If you reject the seed of the Father, and Romans is clear on him being the seed of the Father, you do, you do not have life. You're just a living organism headed for destruction. When you receive Jesus, you become a child of God. If you do not have Jesus, you are not a child of God. So don't give people false hope. Tell them, oh, you're a child of God. Yeah, you're going to be going to heaven. You are not going to go to heaven. You are headed for hell. And we need to tell people that plainly. God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him, just believe in him, receive him, should not perish but have everlasting life. That's love. That's just the beginning of it. This, can anybody tell me why he took this beating? Isaiah 53. Can anybody tell me why Jesus took this beating? Absolutely not. It's not for our sins. So what's this part for? You said by his stripes we are healed. This was for healing. The cross was for sin. So we had this discussion in the men's study Wednesday night because people, this is very common among Christians. They will say, it's not always God's will to heal. God doesn't heal everybody. He might want you to be sick. Then he shouldn't have done this. If it's not his will, he didn't have to take this beating. This beating was for healing. With his stripes we are healed. It pleased the Lord to disease him. It literally says bruised. It says bruised in English, but it pleased the Lord to disease him. All our diseases, all our sicknesses, God did not create disease. And he is not glorified in disease. He's glorified in this. If it's not his will to heal, then tell me why he took this beating. And if it's not always his will to heal, I challenge you, I will give you $10,000 right now if you bring up to me a scripture in the New Testament that says God said no when anybody asked to be healed. Show me. My seminary professor said, I will challenge all of you. I will give you $1,000 if you can show me where Jesus performed miracles just to show who he was. He said he did not. He always said, according to your faith, be it unto you. I will give you $10,000 if you will show me where it's not God's will to heal. 
that he said no. Somebody came and said, Lord, heal me. He said, no. Did he ever? Oh, the Syrophoenician woman. She came and said, Lord, my daughter is grievously vexed of a devil. And he said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so she cried again. And he said, it's not right to take the children's bread. He's talking, because he's only dealing with Jews. Jesus only spoke to Jews when he was on earth. Occasionally to a single Gentile, but he said he came unto his own. Later, the apostles will go to Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world in the new covenant, which starts at the death. But he said, it's not right to take the children's bread and give it to dogs. And she said, true. True, Lord, but I'm willing to eat the crumbs. The dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Can I just have the crumbs? And he said, woman, great is your faith. Go in peace. Your daughter is healed. He wouldn't even say no to outsiders. The Roman soldier came and said, my servant lies grievously vexed. And Jesus said, I'll come and heal him. He said, no, no. No, I don't need you to come. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy that you come under my roof. But I am a soldier. I have a hundred soldiers under me. I'm a centurion. I have a hundred soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go. And he goes. And to this one, comes, And he comes. Because I have authority. I don't need you to come. I just need you to say it. Because you have authority. Demons obey you. The universe obeys you. I just need you to say the word. And Jesus said, go. And his servant was healed. And he said, I haven't found so great faith. No, not in all of Israel. And these were outsiders. And they recognized who he was. But I see so many Christians. I was visiting a man regularly who had this respiratory problem. And I'm saying the Lord will heal you. And his wife told me, before you go in, do not mention healing again. Don't tell him he's going to be healed. He needs to just die. He's been suffering long enough. Don't tell him there's healing. And I was flabbergasted. Don't tell him? You're telling me not to tell him the word of God? No, because it's not God's will. See, this is what people say. That is unbelief. This is unnecessary. That is not a true doctrine. When I hear people say that, I think you are an unbeliever. I'm sorry. I heard Charles Stanley say, I was amazed. One sermon I was listening to, he said, I've gotten to the place where I think if you don't believe in the Lord for healing, you're an unbeliever. We quote Isaiah 53. Yeah, he took my sins. I'm glad he took my sins. But he took your sicknesses. Oh, let's cut this part out. Jesus, that whole beating, when you got all your skin beat off of you, that was unnecessary. Because if the doctor says it can't be done, it can't be done. It's just, it has to be God's will. No, it's not God's will. It's your unbelief. And I'm not saying people are sick because of unbelief. Well, if you believe, I'm just saying we should never say it's God's will but I know somebody who really trusted God and they died. Well, you know what? I know people who didn't get saved. So does that mean it's not God's will to save? Do you know that most people on earth are not saved? So that must mean it's not God's will to save. True? If everybody's not saved, then it's not his will. Because he's God and he's sovereign. So if everybody's not healed, it's not his will. Not true. Those who believe and receive him are saved. Those who believe and receive healing are healed. It doesn't mean it happens instantly all the time. We go through trials. But to say this is not God's will, then I have to wonder why he did this. Why did you do that? Like if you just want us to be sick anyway. Oh, he's glorified. He's glorified because I'm so sick. It's a glory to God. It's my cross. That is not your cross. Your cross is persecution. He said, take up your cross. He was talking about persecution, not sickness. We listened to a whole study. Barry Bennett did an eight-part series on healing, so we listened to part one Wednesday night. Uh, if anybody wants to look at it, I really encourage you to look at it. Um, my, my, cousin wouldn't, my cousin and his wife would not give up on my, uh, my, their son, Stephen. He went through the leukemia, he was bald, he was a young boy, and it just went on and on. And finally, they were at the children's hospital, and the doctor said, he's, he's dying now. His organs are all shutting down, his heart rate is going down, his respiration, his kidneys are shutting down, everything's shutting down. He's got 45 minutes. 
Jack and Kathy got on their knees. They're praying. And she said, oh, don't do that in here. And they said, oh, no, we're praying for our son. And she said, we want to give him a comic book. It's going to start getting dark. We want him to know what to expect as he dies in the next few minutes. And they said, no. All of a sudden, his heart rate starts picking up. Boom, boom, boom. Everything's picking up. The whole team rushes in. Over 10 doctors. What did we do? They said, we didn't do anything. We don't know what's happening. Boom, boom, boom. Everything's functioning. He gets up. He's alive and well with the family. He played basketball for Wilmington University. He played with the Harlem Globetrotters. The doctor received Christ a few months later. She said, this is not possible if Jesus is not real. That boy was dead, as good as dead. It's only through Jesus. So she received Jesus. And then his brother Matt got leukemia. He's supposed to die. He's still alive and well. He went to our school. They didn't give up. They didn't accept the word. Oh, they said there's nothing to be done. He's dying. You know, it's 45 minutes to go. We don't listen to that. My wife, when we were in the specialist's office, and he said, you're not well. And he starts saying all this. She said, let God be true, but every man a liar. My wife says, when you ask her, do you have this or that? She said, I don't, I don't have that. I don't claim that I have that. I claim that I have healing. We need to declare the word of God. But let's look at salvation because I, you know, I, I, want to, I want to move on with this message. I wanted to just make that point about why he was beaten. Now they're going to take this blood-drained body. He's already lost about a fourth to a third of his body. He couldn't carry the cross, so they got Simon of Cyrene to carry the cross. They took him and put all those nerve endings, because there's no skin, bare nerve endings on the cross. And now he's suffering. Let's read some scriptures because I want us to look at the blood. Because I think a lot of teaching has gotten away from the blood. Oh, we don't talk about the blood. Well, you better talk about it. Because I talk about it every time I pray. God, I come in Jesus' name through the blood. Having, therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. We went this past uh, Thursday, uh, Kimberly's class, 7th and 8th grade, actually 4th through 8th. We went to Lancaster to the tabernacle, and they have a full model of the tabernacle, and we all sat around it, and then we were allowed to go look through the windows at the Holy of Holies. And only the, the, they showed they have a model of Aaron there with the bells on his tassels because the high priest has to have bells on and a rope around his leg because if he goes back there and he's not right, he'll die. So if they hear that the bells aren't tingling anymore, they're listening, tingling, and the, the curtain's about four inches thick. It's really heavy. Oh, the one in the temple anyway, not in the tabernacle. And they hear the bells moving. They think, okay, he's still alive. But if they don't hear the bells for a long time, they think, all right, he died. We can't go get him because we'll die if we go in there. You can't be in the presence of God. So they pull him out from under the curtain. But now we have boldness, confidence to go into the Holy of Holies, not on earth, but in heaven through the blood. They could never go in without blood. They had to offer the blood and go in and sprinkle it on the, on the mercy seat and all. We go in through the blood of Jesus. And he's our high priest, ever living to make intercession for us. Let's go to our, these scriptures. Isaiah 52, 14. This was speaking of the, the beating. But many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured he seemed hardly human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know he was a man. Pilate had to say when he walked up, he said, H.E. Homo. That means behold the man. That's a man. What is that thing? What is that thing on two legs that just looks like ground meat, just blood dripping? His face is so disfigured. They pulled the beard out already. And now they beat him so badly, there's no skin. It's just pieces of muscle and organs showing what is standing beside Pilate. That's God. That's God who just gave himself to be beaten to a pulp by his creation that he came to save. And he dies. He takes the sin and Barabbas goes free. Let's go to the next one. Isaiah 53. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins, Beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. He was whipped so we... That whipping was so we could be healed. And people say, that's spiritual healing. Okay, 
You want to say it's spiritual healing? Spiritual healing? Then you have to go to the book of Matthew, and you have to remove scriptures because it said Jesus healed those with fevers, those that were infirm, those that were lame, those that were blind. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Definitely physical. The Bible is its own best commentary. So you look at other scriptures and you see it was physical healing. Acts 10.38, Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. That's the blood. Let's go down. Hebrews 9.22. So let's go to the cross. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Does everybody hear that? Without the shedding, present, progress, present verb, present tense verb, present progressive, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. Let me ask you this. How many of you ask God every day to forgive you for your sins? You shouldn't. You know why? If you read the book of Hebrews, it's very clear. He died once. He died for all. He took away the sins of the world. He's the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. So your sins are already taken away. If you ask him to forgive you, he's going to be looking down from heaven like, die again? It literally says, if he were going to do that, then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. He'd have to do it often. Ever since I found he had die, rise again, die, rise again, die, rise again. So if you say, forgive me, he says, okay, I have to die and rise again. I have to shed blood. But you already did it, right, because I already took away your sins. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them anymore. Oh, so the whole world's saved? Nope. He that has the Son has life. The sin separated us from God. The wall is taken away. All you have to do is say, okay, there's nothing to stop him from coming in now. Oh, I was too bad. He's saying, well, I don't care. I already took that away. I want to come and live in you. Can I come and live in you? Will you receive me? Will you let me be your God? Will you be one with me? He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit with the Lord. And most of the world says no. Salvation is Christ in you. Paul said the mystery of the gospel hid from the ages is Christ in you, your only hope of glory. Sin has been dealt with. There's one sin not dealt with because you can't forgive it. It's unpardonable. You cannot forgive this one sin, and this is the only sin sending people to hell. Jesus said when the Holy Spirit's come, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness and judgment to come, of sin because they believe not on me. That can't be forgiven. It has to be changed. You have to stop being an unbeliever and being a believer. You can't be forgiven in this life nor the life to come. Rejecting Jesus cannot be forgiven. It's not a forgivable offense. It's a changeable offense. You're rejecting me. You're not believing. You need to turn and receive me and believe. That has to have an action. You have to be a believer. You can't be forgiven of being an unbeliever. You have to be believing. Let's look at some of the scriptures that talk about his blood. In whom we have redemption through his blood. We sold our souls. He bought them back. That's redemption. He redeemed us. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. But it's through the blood. Redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sins through his blood according to the riches of his grace. He shed his blood by his grace. We don't deserve it. Let's go to the next one. Revelation 1.5. Beginning of the Bible to the end. The scarlet thread of redemption. And from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness. And the first begotten of the dead. He's the first to rise from the dead. And the prince of the kings of the earth. Unto him that loved us. And washed us from our sins. In his own blood. You cannot be washed any other way. It's only in his blood. Let's go to the next scripture. 1 Peter 1, 18 to 20. For you know that God paid a ransom. He paid a ransom. Do you ever hear people being kidnapped and they want a ransom price? 
I remember in probably the 80s, I'm trying to remember the name of the family. I, it's right on the tip of my tongue, and I can't say it, but they were a very wealthy, multi-millionaire family, and they got their, they kidnapped the daughter and buried her in the woods alive with a pipe where she got air, but she was there so that they couldn't find her and they had to pay millions of dollars and finally the FBI and all, they showed pictures in National Geographic, I still remember. They went and they found the location and they dug her up and she had been lying there, of course there's no bathroom or anything. And they were weeping, the men when they dug her up were, were weeping. But thank God she lived, but they had to pay a high price to get her back. At that point, you say, you can have everything I own. That's the way I would feel. I don't care if I'm a billionaire. If you have my child, I'll, get, I'll, give, I'll give my life. So they paid and they got her back. Well, we cost more than that. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors, and the ransom he paid was not mere gold or silver. There's not enough on earth. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. He paid his own blood. God gave God's blood to redeem us and to wash us. Acts 2, 28, Paul says, or not Paul, he says, feed and shepherd, yes it was, feed and shepherd God's flock, his church, purchased with his own blood. Hey everybody, we're the church, aren't we? Have you received Christ? Now we're not talking about gospel of grace, that's just uh, an organization. The church is Jesus' body. So whether you're here or down the street at Baraka or somewhere else, we're the body of Christ. We're the church. He says, feed and shepherd God's flock, his church, that he purchased with his own blood. He bought us. That's why in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, what? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own? For you are bought with a price. And what is the price? He purchased us with his own blood. He purchased us. We belong to him. For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. God owns my body. God owns my spirit. I've been purchased. Paul said, Peter said, John said, all of them when they start off writing from Paul, the slave of Christ. From Peter, the slave of Christ. I mentioned that at school and they said, slave, I said, absolutely. And I love it. When you have a master this good, there's nothing I'd rather be than a slave, but also a child. I am the slave of Jesus Christ because I'm purchased. But my master's so good. In the Old Testament, when people had a master that was really good, the year of Jubilee would come and they could go free and they would say, I don't wanna go free. I don't have a hard master. He treats my family like his own. He gives us the best housing, the best food, the best clothing. He loves us. I want to stay. So they would go out to the fence post and they would drive an all through their ear in front of witnesses and say, I want to remain his slave forever for my life. And they did that because my master's so good. Why would I leave? If I go on my own, I'm not going to have the care. I'm not going to be able to even make it. And he gives me everything. He loves us and he takes care of us. That's the way it is. I'm fine with this master. This master is great. This master died for me. So our faith is to be in his blood. So let's see what our salvation, it's in his blood. Let's go down now. Romans 3.25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Does anybody know that the word atone is really not used in the New Testament? That's a translation. It was, became acceptable because of constant theological usage, but atonement is not what Jesus did. Jesus did not atone for you. If he did, we're in trouble. Atone means to cover. The blood of bulls and goats covered sin temporarily until Jesus comes. Atonement means to cover. Propitiation is to take it away. John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who 
covers the sins of the world, who takes away the sins of the world. He did far more than cover. He took it away. He took away our sins as far as the east is from the west. Well, how far is that? Well, it doesn't give a point. It's infinity. The east from the west, that's how far he removed our transgressions from us. And he said, your sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. propitiation through faith in his blood. Faith in his blood. It's my faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remissions of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. We say, yeah, the sins that are passed, but how about my present sins? He's saying the sins have passed. All our sins passed at the cross. You know when you say a person passed? <laughs> well, this is past tense. Our sins are past. Well, how many of them were past? If I'm going by time, God's outside of time, I say, no, that was 2,000 years ago. I didn't even sin yet. I wasn't even born yet. But he said he took away the sins of the entire world from Adam to the last person. They're in the past. Romans 5, 6 to 8. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for a good person. Nevertheless, for a righteous person, some would even dare to die. I did this in chapel last week. I said, I asked the kids, I, I brought up a few students. We'd had a few students who were misbehaving on the trip, and one of the teachers came up to me and said, can they, not, can they be disqualified from the future trips? So I, I brought them up, and I just said, I didn't, point them out and said, hypothetically, let's say that these students were being bad on the trip and that they're not allowed to go on future trips. But I had another boy come up, ask him ahead of time if he would participate. And he said, yeah. And I said, you better watch what you're asking for. So he came up and I said, Jonah, these two and another student can't go on trips, the next trip. So I said, that's three. So would you be willing to take their punishment for them? And he said, yeah, and I said, okay, so that means you don't go on any more trips this year to take care of those three? And he said, no. I said, you're not willing? He said, no. <laughs> I'm not bearing that. So ask people if they're willing to die for somebody. Yeah, some of the kids are raising hands. Yeah, I would die for him. I said, that's easy to say. Peter said, I'll go with you to prison and to death until somebody points the gun at you or puts the sword at you, and then you change your mind. Some, for... You know, sometimes people do. You know, I've heard of stories where somebody throws a grenade in a, uh, this was a true story, over in Iraq, and the one sergeant jumped on it, covered it with his body, and blew up, and it was enough to prevent the others from getting killed by the shrapnel. So he gave his life. Some people give their life as a living sacrifice, and it goes on and on and on, not just once. So sometimes a person might die for somebody else, but not usually. But, go to verse 9. But God showed his great love to us by sending Christ to die for us while we were sinners. It wasn't good people. You say, well, this is good people. I'll die for them. He died for sinners, for enemies. Do you know that if you haven't received Christ, you're an enemy of God? An enemy. If you're rejecting him, you're an enemy of God. Because he goes on in verse, and he says, Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him, because he took the wrath for us. All the wrath of God for sin was poured out on Jesus on the cross. All the anger for sin was poured out on him. Can you imagine for the whole world? No wonder he died. I'm, I don't know how he did the last six seconds. But he says, God commended his love toward us, and that while we were sinners, and if when we were enemies, verse 10 says, if when we were enemies we were reconciled by the death of his son, much more now that we're reconciled we'll be saved by his life. Okay, let's go to Ephesians. But now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. See, it's only through the blood of Christ we're brought near to God. Without the blood of Christ, you're not coming near. You cannot go into the Holy of Holies without blood. And the blood of Christ. Does anybody ever hear the song, uh, Arise, My Soul, Arise? 
Arise, my soul, arise. You ever hear that? It says, five bleeding wounds he bears received on Calvary. They pour effectual prayers. They strongly plead for me. Forgive him, oh, forgive, they cry. Forgive him, oh, forgive, they cry, nor let that ransom sinner die. He's, he, his wounds are always being showed. His blood has already covered the altar there. We come in the name of Jesus through his blood. Okay. Hebrews 10, 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. That's why I have confidence. I can't get on my knees and pray. I could go, oh, God, please hear me. I don't have to say, oh, God, please hear me. I say, I come in Jesus' name and through the blood. I'm confident when I come. Because I'm coming through the blood of Jesus, and you always receive, accept the blood of Jesus. What does Isaiah 53 say also? When you make his soul an offering for sin, God will see his seed, Jesus. He will prolong your days, and the pleasure of the Lord will prosper in your hands. He will see as a travail of his soul and be satisfied. He's satisfied with the offering of Jesus. That's the only thing that satisfies him. Not, oh, I was good today. You know what? I, I, I was overcoming this week. I didn't fall into sin this week. I didn't say, you bring that. That's dirty toilet paper. Filthy rags in God's sight. At your best, it's still filthiness. I come in Jesus' name and through his blood. Our last scripture is here because this is what we're going to do now. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. What was the old covenant? Did anybody tell me what the old covenant was? The Ten Commandments? Who was it given to? The nation of Israel? Right? Was it given? And it wasn't given to Abraham. Abraham was an idol-worshipping Gentile in the Ur of the Chaldees. God called him, saved him by his faith, Grace by faith, faith by grace, made a unilateral covenant with him and saved him. And 430 years later, God gave the law. Why did he give the law? Why did Paul say he gave the law? To show people they're sinners. Why? So that they would return to Christ. So if Christ came and people thought, you're here to save me from my what? I don't have any sin. I told the students the other day, when I, I had the bicycle accident a few years ago, I hit the railroad tracks and fell and hit my face, and I broke my nose on both sides and split my eyebrow. And so they put me in for a CAT scan, and like recently they did an x-ray on my neck and found this lump on my neck. So I said, so I'm okay now, right? I had an x-ray. Well, the x-ray showed that the bones were broken or that I had this lump, but it didn't fix anything. It shows me so that I can go to get it taken care of, right? The Ten Commandments is just the x-ray. It just shows you that you're a sinner so that you'll turn to Christ. But actually, the Ten Commandments aren't given to the church. And I see so many churches, and they will argue, we have to follow the Ten Commandments. And I say, go ahead. You're going to die because if you want to follow the Ten Commandments, if you disobey them, then it demands death. So if you want to follow it, Paul said, you that desire to be under the law, do you not hear what the law says? And he makes it plain in Galatians. He says you're under a curse. Well, you need some law and some grace. That's a mixture. That's called lukewarm. God, Jesus said, I'll spew you out of my mouth. We're under a new covenant. When did it start? But Jesus said, yeah, but Jesus was teaching old covenant. He was extending the law because the Pharisees said, we obey all the law. He said, you think you obey the law? You've heard it said you shall not commit adultery. I say, if you look at a woman to lust, you've already committed adultery. If you have hatred in your heart, you're a murderer. He buried everybody. When did the new covenant start, somebody? Tell me when the new covenant started. The day he died on the cross, that's when a will goes into effect. So you go from that point forward and read the scriptures. Now he sends his spirit back to be in the 12, the 70, and the whole church. Now what is he saying? Jesus said, if you don't forgive, neither will your father forgive you. Old covenant. In the new covenant, he says, as Christ forgave you, so forgive others. He forgave you, so forgive others. See, the law is a threat. If you don't do this, you get punished. The new covenant is, hey, I gave you all this. Do the same to others. I showed you love and grace. Show it to others. 
Paul said, if you're stealing, make restitution, do, do penance. He said, no, if you're stealing, cut it out. Stop stealing. Go to work with your hands and, and provide the things you need and give to the poor. Just stop. Right? The new covenant started when Jesus died on the cross. Praise God. So let's have communion now. Javier, would you help us out? Incidentally, when, when the Roman soldiers saw that Jesus had died, they took a spear and rammed it into his side, which opened up his side and blood and water came out. Do you remember the first Adam? What did God do? He put him into deep sleep, which signifies death. He opened up his side and took his bride out. When Jesus died on the cross, they opened his side and the bride is his church, and the church started. When his side was opened, the blood and water flowed out. When the living water flowed out. His Holy Spirit was coming and started his bride, which is the church, the last Adam. He died for us. He shed his blood for us. Not part of it. He shed all his blood for us. Let's all partake of the wafer. Jesus said, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body that's broken for you. His bones were not broken because the scripture said, not a bone shall be broken. If you read Psalm 22, it describes crucifixion in detail. It opens, if you read it in Hebrew, it opens and closes with the first and last words from the cross. It literally ends with, it is finished. But it's a picture, first person of hanging on the cross. He said, my body is broken for you. Do you see, if you, if you ever watch that beating, oh my Lord, I can't watch it, I have to close my eyes. It's so bad, his body was broken for us. His blood was shed for our sins. He didn't have any, but he became sin for us who knew no sin that we'd be made the righteousness of God in him. Let's do this in deep appreciation and remembrance of Jesus Christ.
that is not stronger than the one that walk in power of the blood, the blood that calls us sons and daughters with our hands on by our Father through the Thank you, Jesus. We have we go have a lunch together downstairs, okay? I'm just gonna pray in the name of Jesus. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this amazing word about blood, about your blood, about your special blood, about your sacrifice. We thank you because we we never could pay the high price, this high price, this special price. And I thank you, Jesus, for that. I thank you for this amazing grace. We just thank you so much. And I ask you in the name of Jesus, keep us, Jesus, in your hands. And uh, just remind us that it's not by my work, by your blood only. And I thank you for that in the name of Jesus. Bless us. Give us a blessed week. Give us strength. Healing in the name of Jesus. We thank you for everything. In the name of Jesus, we say, Amen. Amen. That is not stronger than the one that walk in power of the blood. The blood calls us sons and daughters.
Amen. I see you guys downstairs.